Hey, if you're watching this, you are attending the Raising Generational Wealth virtual conference, and I just want to shout you out for taking action. My name is Rakim Sabri, and during this session, I am going to be talking you through establishing financial boundaries. Let's get into it. So a little bit about me. I am an award-winning financial therapist, accredited financial counselor, author, and speaker with an emerging voice in the field of financial therapy and financial empowerment. Most of the work that I do is centered around helping people understand financial trauma. I am trauma of money certified. You can see the little badge in the corner of this slide. I am also a two-time award winner for the Plutus Foundation through my work with my newsletter and Substack called Overcoming Financial Trauma. And I'm also AFC certified. So AFC is um, short for an accredited financial counselor. And that certification is through an organization called the AFCPE or the Association for Financial Counseling and Planning Education. It is a pretty prestigious designation that really speaks to ethics, education, and experience. So in order for me to have gotten that designation, I had to demonstrate an ethic component, an educational component, and an experience component. So I'm super proud of that designation, of the Trauma of Money designation. I am a candidate for the Certified Financial Therapist designation through the Financial Therapy Association. And my goal and my job is to bring inclusive financial education content that helps people heal. So most of the time when we see financial education content, um, hopefully nobody in this conference is adhering to this, but a lot of times when we see financial education content, it is very accusatory. It, it blames you, it speaks to shame, it speaks to guilt, it speaks to fear of what you did wrong and why you are a dumb person. My job and the job of the other educators who are participating in this conference is to encourage you, to empower you, to acknowledge the mistakes that you may have made in the past or the mistakes that you may be making right now and to draw a line in the sand and moving forward. And that's why this presentation on establishing financial boundaries is so important because a lot of times we have great intentions and I'll get into some real life case study experiences with individuals that I have done work with throughout this presentation. But a lot of times we have real life good intentions, but life happens. Things come up and we end up stumbling on the path to accomplishing the goals that we have. I'll raise my hand and say, I also, as educated and credentialed and accomplished as I am financially, still end up making mistakes, and that is okay. As long as we can acknowledge where those stumbling blocks are and where they occur and how do we navigate around it or learn from our experiences so that we don't continue to make the same mistakes, we are making progress. So I want to encourage you all to give yourself grace as we walk through this material and if anything resonates with you, make a note of that. If something makes you kind of feel a certain way, make a note of that and come back to it. Unfortunately, I can't be there with you live, but this presentation is full of information and I'm super excited to get into it with you. So, understanding financial boundaries. What is a boundary? I know this sounds super counterintuitive, right? We know what boundaries are. We know what how to establish financial boundaries, or at least we think that we know. But for the sake of this activity, I want us all to be on the same page. And so I'm going to use a working definition of a financial boundary that we can refer to and point to throughout this presentation. So financial boundary is a rule or a limit that can be imposed against yourself or others to keep you on track to accomplish a financial goal or maintain financial disciplines. So when we think about financial boundaries, a lot of times the first thought that we might have is telling somebody no. 
right? I can't lend you money. I can't go out with you. I can't spend money on that thing. And people have a hard enough time, as it is, telling other people no, ironically, right? Especially if you are a parent and you have a child who has a want or a need, their friends have it, other parents are buying it for them, their teachers are asking for it. And so a lot of times you might feel as a parent um, pressured to bend what those boundaries that you may have established for yourself are in order to see your kid be happy. But there is boundaries that we can impose against ourselves, And a lot of times we already do that, or at least we already know that we should be doing that through the common practice of budgeting. Budgeting, although it should not be viewed as a restrictive activity, and should be more so embraced as an activity that lets you know where things are moving by way of your income and your expenses, it is also acting as a financial boundary. That boundary is put in place to protect you and your finances, the goals that you have for your money, the goals that you have for yourself that are impacted by money and prevent you from doing things like overspending, or going into debt, or help you get out of situations like eliminating debt or setting up your retirement and planning for retirement age, or setting up your child's college education fund, or planning for vacations or trips or even holidays that occur in the same year. So when we think about financial boundaries, we need to look at it from an intrinsic perspective that says, This is what I want to accomplish, so this is what I'm going to put in place that allows for me to do that. And we need to look at it from an extrinsic perspective that says, if I'm coming up on the last $100 in my budget that I allocated for recreational spending, then the next time an event occurs that costs beyond that $100 that I've allocated for this, I'm going to have to say no. And those events happen very randomly throughout the day. It could be your coworkers inviting you to happy hour. It could be you bought coffee on the way to work and you decided you want to get a bagel. It could be you decided that you wanted to splurge on date night. There are so many different things that you should and you deserve to participate in, but you have to do it within the confines of the boundary that you set for yourself. And in a minute, I'm going to talk about the difference between establishing your goals and establishing values and how those things come into play. But before I get into that, I want to talk about some common financial boundaries and what they look like. So common financial boundaries, the list goes on, right? But we're going to speak to three of the common financial boundaries that I see. And those common financial boundaries can look like personal spending limits. So that is, I am not going to spend more than $100 per week or more than $200 per week based off of your income on going out on um, happy hour, on Starbucks, on lunch, on whatever, right? I'm going to set this as this is my personal spending limit on these activities. Outside of these activities, I got food at home. I can make coffee at home. I can hang out with my friends or my coworkers in another venue. Like these are the boundaries that I'm going to set for myself. So these are personal spending limits. Personal saving and investing limits. So you might say, and actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that one for last. And oh, I have a little typo there, but this should read personal lending limits, not personal personal lending limits. And that means if a member of my family or one of my friends comes to me and they say, "Hey, I need to borrow X amount of dollars," you already have in your mind this is what I can and what I'm willing to part ways with, but beyond that, I'm not going to do it. And so a lot of times people may feel away or they may feel that you may present yourself in such a way that it looks like you have money. 
um, or that it look like you're wealth signaling, or maybe you're not wealth signaling, but somebody is determining that because of the type of work that you do, you have money to fix their emergency. It's important to have a personal, not personal, a personal lending limit. And then the last one, the reason why I want to come back to this is because I'm going to throw a little bit of uh, financial therapy in this personal saving and investing limits. Now, you might say, Rakim, why should I have a personal saving and investing limit? Shouldn't the goal be for me to invest and save as much as I possibly can? Kind of is the answer to that question, right? What I have seen in the profession is that there are people who, based off of previous negative experiences that they have had financially, will do what's referred to as hoarding money, right? People become extremely money vigilant, which is one of four popular money scripts coined by Dr. Brad and Dr. Ted Klotz. And in money vigilance, people may go to the extreme of what would normally be considered a positive financial behavior. And so you, in establishing financial boundaries, want to make sure that, yes, you're, you're putting a limit on the bad behavior or what could be viewed as negative behavior through overspending, but you also want to put a limit on what can be viewed as positive behavior to the extreme by oversaving or overinvesting, particularly if that saving or investing activity is going to put your day-to-day -day life experience under duress, right? So you're saving and you're investing so much that you can't afford to pay your electricity bill or your mortgage or your rent. You're actually putting yourself in a situation where you're going to have to go backwards and pull from that saving and investing so that you can continue to meet your lifestyle expenses. And so that's why it's also important, or that's another reason rather, why it's important for you to have a budget so that you can monitor the income and the expenses in a way that helps you to establish realistic behaviors and goals. Now, the benefits of financial boundary setting, right? Stress reduction, first and foremost, right? Managing those limits can reduce, often will reduce anxiety because you know what you can give, what you can spend, what you can save. And you also know if you go beyond that, that you're going to be putting additional pressure on yourself. Now, this is not a black and white situation. Obviously, if you're in a situation where you know what your limits are, but you, based off of the need to survive, are going beyond those limits, then yes, you will still probably experience aspects of financial stress or financial anxiety that can lead to financial trauma. And so if you are in a situation where, despite establishing financial boundaries, you end up uh, feeling extremely pressured, then uh, you can seek out the help of a professional accredited uh, financial counselor, a CFP, a financial therapist, so that they can help provide you with strategies and actions to take in the reduction of that financial stress. Second benefit, improve relationships, right? I, I don't know about you, but I am definitely somebody who um, prefers to hear the truth from my friends and from my family. I am somebody who is really big on communication. And if somebody says to me, you know what, Rakim, I can't go out with you to dinner tonight because I just don't got it. Right. I, I don't have the money to do that. I'm going to respect that. But more than that, and where a lot of people I'll talk about this in the next slide, where a lot of people are confusing the behavior of establishing or I'm sorry, um, reinforcing bound of reinforcing the bonds that they have in their relationships is that they have to spend money. Right. They say, oh, in order for me to um, execute on the value that I have of spending time with my friends and my family, we have to go out to a nice restaurant or we have to go to a coffee shop and spend money or we have to go to this place. Usually the bonding activity is taking place in an environment where you have to or you are strongly encouraged to or you are strongly tempted to 
spend the money. And so if you could be upfront about what your goals are and what obstacles you might be navigating or the discipline that you are establishing here for yourself, it is going to improve the relationship that you have with your friends, with your family, maybe even with your coworkers. And if it doesn't improve that relationship, then it lets you know that that may not be the right relationship for you. And then lastly, benefit of establishing financial boundaries is long-term financial help. Health. Boundaries can help protect and grow your financial resources because you are not overspending, you are not going deeper into debt, you're taking intentional actions to get out of situations where maybe you have a lot of debt, you are planning for retirement, you are saving, you are investing within means. And so long-term financial health is going to be the result of the financial boundaries that you set both internally and externally. All right, so how do you set effective financial boundaries? Well, one, it's important for you to audit your values. And I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but a lot of times the values that we cling on to are values that we have inherited, right? They are influenced by things like culture, religion, the uh, relationships that we have, the career that we decide to go into. And so when we are um, taking an audit of the values that we have, we get to choose which of those values we want to hold on to and which of those values we want to get rid of. And so it's super important to audit your values and decide what is it after this point that I want to move forward into the future with. And that value can look like I want to spend more time with my friends and my family. I want to be more present in the lives of in the lives of my partner and my children. I want to, it could be in the opposite direction. I want to make more money. And so I'm going to prioritize making money. There is no right or wrong answer in how you establish your values as long as you know what those values are and you are making the decision to choose those values. Same thing is true of your goals. In establishing your financial goals, you want to look at how those goals came to be your goals, right? Was it something that you read in a book? Was it something that you heard on a podcast? Something that you saw scrolling on Instagram? I want to be a millionaire by the time I turn 30. I want to have X, Y, like some of these goals are goals that we hear other people say we should have and we decide that sounds really good that's a goal for me and not so much that this goal is something that is tied directly into something that i value and so the first bullet point that i have under establishing goals is understanding how your values influence your goals if you say that one of your goals is to become a millionaire by the time that you're 30 but you have children and a partner and your income is not going to allow for you to reach that goal, then you are setting yourself up for failure because not, not because you don't deserve it, not because you don't work hard enough, but because your inputs are not going to match those outputs. And that's not to say that if you don't, if you have a family or you are working in, in a, a lower income or middle income job that being a millionaire is off the table. But when we establish goals, we need to make sure that we are establishing SMART goals. And so we know the SMART acronym, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. And then lastly, you want to be authentic in your goal setting and remind yourself, who is this goal for? And lastly, in establishing the financial boundaries, I said it in the last slide. I'm going to say it in this slide again. It is important for you to communicate. It's important for you to practice what those communication strategies look like, to practice the verbiage that you're going to use, and to practice providing alternative solutions that align with your values. So again, if your values say, I want to be more present in the lives of my friends and my family, but you are presented with an opportunity to be among your friends and your family, that you have to spend money, well, you can communicate, you know what? I want to spend time with my friends and my family. However, I can't spend money. Why don't we gather at my house or gather at your house? And then we can spend time together without having to spend money. Providing alternative solutions takes the sting out of the no and says, you are still important to me. But 
I just can't spend money with you or I can't spend time with you the way that we're used to spending time together because of the financial goals that I have. So here is an alternative solution for you. Now, some challenges in maintaining those financial boundaries are going to look like self-soothing, right? You're in a situation where you're saying, well, I deserve it, right? I'm going to go and do the retail therapy thing. Or I feel bad today. I'm going to go and get me an extra uh, venti drink from Starbucks. I keep using Starbucks as an example because I'm a Starbucks drinker. But we find ways how to uh, celebrate ourselves and how to soothe ourselves. And a lot of times the ways that we find to celebrate and soothe ourselves are tied into overspending. Another challenge in maintaining financial boundaries might be experiencing the guilt trip, right? So if you tell somebody, hey, look, sorry, I cannot give you any money, right? It's taking away from my goals. Then they may hit you with the, oh, you think you're better than us. Oh, you think that you, whatever, right? I've heard it all because I, I have also struggled with establishing financial boundaries. And so the guilt trip may wear on you and you say, you know what? I'm going to abandon these boundaries because I just don't want to hear this person's mouth anymore or because I don't want this person to be sad or because I don't want this person to have an attitude with me. And what ends up happening is by you yielding into the pressure that's coming externally, you are creating an internal pressure because you are not honoring the value that you have articulated to yourself or the goal rather that you have articulated to yourself based off of maybe a mix match in your values um, or an oversight in your values, right? Because the, the way that the person who is giving you the guilt trip feels is, is, is clearly more important than the goal that you have established for yourself. Third one is avoidant behavior. So what does avoidant behavior look like? Avoidant behavior is a reference to those money scripts that I had mentioned earlier um, in a money script that is referred to as money avoidance. And so avoidant behavior can look like I'm not checking my bank statements, I'm not looking at my bank account, I'm not looking at my credit card bill, I'm not looking at bills until I see the red line on it that says that they're getting ready to cut it off. I, if, if I pretend that it's not there, then it doesn't exist, right? And so you cannot make informed financial decisions or you cannot adhere to the disciplines that you are setting for yourself if you don't know what's going on. And so avoidant behavior can be a challenge to maintaining those financial boundaries because if you are not inspecting, then you don't know whether or not you are on target. And then I mentioned this kind of in passing, but I'm going to mention it again, a mixed match in your values and your goals. So your value might say one thing, your goal might say something completely different. And because those values and those goals are not aligned, they're going to clash. You are going to end up in a situation where you have to choose between what makes you feel good and what actually sounds good. And so these challenges can, and there, I'm sure that there are others, but these are primary, four primary challenges that will show up in help, in going against maintaining your financial boundaries. And so those are things that you should look out for. And I am running out of time, but I wanted to thank you all. I wish that I was there to go through your Q&A, uh, to answer any questions that you might have. Definitely in the next slide, I'm going to give you a way to get in contact with me if you want to further the conversation or if you want to learn more about the services that I offer. But to celebrate and to thank you for your attention and your particip participation in this summit, you will get a free digital copy of the flow workbook the flow workbook is a workbook that me and a buddy of mine coach james had worked on in 2023 to bring together the world of budgeting and money systems with financial wellness so we both pulled from our unique skill sets and expertise to create this book we put a lot of work into it and it's not easy to give up for free but as a thank you and with a little bit of nudging from uh, Clifton, I decided that I was going to let it go for free. So that is yours. Enjoy it. I hope that it is super helpful on your financial journey. I hope that this talk has been very helpful 
on your financial journey. And before you go, I will give you a way to communicate with me. You can visit my website at rockhemsabri.com or you can email me at rockhem at rockhemsabri.com. All spelled out on the screen for you. But I wanted to share this testimonial that I received from a financial therapy session with a client who is actually experiencing issues with financial boundaries. And a lot of the information, actually all of the information that I shared with you all over the last 25 minutes has been directly pulled from the conversation that me and this individual had. So this individual says, I had a great experience meeting with Rakim. The overall experience was so surprising because this is not the financial conversations of old. He truly wanted to understand our situation, priorities, and he was not judgmental but encouraging. He had he was a great listener and helped us change our perspective on our relationship with money. Now, this um, particular review came from a couple. Um, the husband in the relationship reached out to me. I had the husband and the wife on the line, and there was a mixed match in values, and certainly there was some clashing between their financial goals and their financial value. So imagine having two different sets of values between you and your partner. And within those two different uh, sets of values, you have individual values and goals that are both clashing on the part of you and on the part of your partner. It is a recipe for chaos. So financial therapy is something that I do offer in one-off sessions. I also offer packages around financial coaching. You can, again, feel free to reach out to me via my website or via my email at www.rockhamsabri.com or rockham at rockhamsabri.com. It has absolutely been a pleasure, and I hope that you got as much out of this as I got out of putting it together. Like I said, I wish I could be there to engage with you, uh, but hopefully I hear from some of you, and um, make sure that you are establishing those financial boundaries. See you guys.